Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to be with you. I thought I'd start out, since we're all horse people, we've probably all been hurt at one time or another, and many of us have been anesthetized. So if you've been anesthetized, uh, basically you're told sometimes a month in advance you're going to be anesthetized. As you're anesthetized, you're lying in a bed. They give you a blanket to keep you warm. You're, least, you're asked at least five times if you have any drug allergies and when was the last time you ate something. You're told what's going to happen to you and they ask you at least five times additionally if you have any questions. You sort of drift off to sleep. You wake up when surgery is over. They put you in your car with a wheelchair and you go home and you watch movies for a week. Let's think about horses for a minute. No one can really explain to them what's going to happen to them. They're van to a surgical facility like ours. They walk into a padded room. They're given a sedative to calm them. They're given drugs intravenously then to cause them to fall asleep and slump to the ground. They're hoisted by their feet, placed on a surgery table. They don't know this is going on, but it happens. The surgery is performed. That's a minor part of this talk, but we needed to mention that. They're hoisted by their feet, placed in a padded room then for recovery. They wake up and rise to their feet, usually within about 60 minutes. No wheelchairs. They walk back to their stall and eat, usually within two hours. And then sometime that day or the next day, they're van back to their home stable. So you say, well, that might be stressful for horses, and it is. So it's reasonable to assume that it's stressful. And we've, there's been a number of scientific studies done that looked at this. And Indices of stress like cortisol and catecholamine levels increase in horses compared to people and compared to any of the domestic animals that we routinely anesthetize. So horses are stressed by anesthesia. So how do we deal with that and try to reduce that stress as best we can? Just looking at the numbers in people, the incidence of significant problems in anesthesia is about 1 in 100,000. In dogs, it's about one in 2,000. In cats, it's about one in 1,000. There's been a lot of studies done in horses, and the risks range, the estimated risks ranges from one in 63 to about one in 1,000 anesthetics. So why do horses have increased risk? We already talked about we bring them in a room and we knock them off their feet. For that's stressful, but horses are not really made to be recumbent for any good period of time. Particularly, they're not meant to be on their back. The yellow line that I hope you can see on the uh, picture is sort of the line of the diaphragm of the horse. And so you see the intestines behind the uh, yellow line and the, and the uh, lungs to the left. Now, when you roll this horse on its back, those intestines are sitting on its lungs, basically. Now, the diaphragm's in between, but so the intestines compress the lungs. So we have a really good chance for respiratory embarrassment with the horse that's on its back. It also compresses the caudal vena cava and screws up the perfusion of the horse. So you have cardiopulmonary embarrassment when you put a horse in recumbency, particularly dorsal recumbency. So we have, again, cardiovascular respiratory compromise. We need to support that cardiovascular function. We use intravenous fluids and we use agents that increase cardiac output. A notable one would be dobutamine uh, as necessary to maintain blood flow and adequate blood pressure. Respiratory function is depressed as well. The lungs are compressed. And so we need to support that respiratory function, usually with ventilation and increasing the inspired oxygen concentrations. Not that they don't do these in people, but they're more critically important in the horse. The other thing about horses is that it's important to, re, to keep the anesthetic times to a minimum. The sort of the less than golden period would be sometimes if you're longer than three hours, that's a really long time for a horse, and we like to keep our surgeries to an hour or less in most instances whenever we can. So other things about the increase in anesthetic risk. If you think an average horse weighs 1,000 pounds, and for Kentucky that might be a little light, but I think it's pretty close. It's really important to maintain adequate blood pressures to ensure blood flow, particularly to the downside of the horse. When you're in lateral recumbency, the downside needs to be perfused. There's the whole weight of the horse sitting on the skin and the muscles of the downside. When the horse is in dorsal recumbency, the whole weight of the horse is sitting on the skin and the muscles of the rump. 
So when you're anesthetizing horses, it's really critical to monitor arterial blood pressures. Now, when you're anesthetized or when you go in and you get your check, at, even at the dentist anymore, they put a cuff on your arm and estimate what your blood pressure is and tell you, you know, how you're doing that day. Uh, those cuffs aren't accurate enough for horses. So when we anesthetize horses, they really need a catheter to be placed in the artery so you can monitor blood pressure in that way. So anytime you have anesthetized a horse for anything beyond a really short procedure, you're going to measure arterial blood pressure and you're going to look at respiratory function. Other thing you do is pad and position the horse. Here, about foot thick foam rubber pads, uh, keeping the entire weight of the horse supported. And then it's also important to keep the weight of the upper leg from compressing the weight of the lower leg. So you put a pretty significant pad between their legs as well. Other reasons why horses have somewhat of an an increased anesthetic risk is that they're flight animals. They tend to want to leave uh, when they're put in a stressful situation. That's their initial response. And so they're awakening from anesthesia. Maybe they've never awoken from anesthesia before. They're laying on the ground. They're in a room they've never been in before. Uh, they may try to paddle. They may try to get up and leave. And so we sedate them as we move them to the recovery stall, and we restrain them in lateral recumbency until we think they're ready to get up, and then we support their rising to their feet with a head and tail rope. And then what really what the tail rope does is slows their forward momentum somewhat, and so they don't roll over themselves as they go to stand. Horses that are at added risk from the studies, we know that older horses and very young horses have somewhat of an increased anesthetic risk. The very big horses, they're harder to help in recumbency, harder, harder to help to get from a recumbent position to a standing position. Just think about when a horse stands in the field. They look pretty awkward. If they're, you know, a horse gets down and rolls in and goes to stand. The old horses, they get, takes them a while to get up. And the big horses, they're a little awkward as they do that. So, Putting it in context, they're essentially raising a thousand pounds three feet off the ground every time they stand. And you know, that there aren't many of us, I don't think, that could do that. Emergencies and other surgeries have increased risk. Again, we talked about time, a longer procedure brings an increased risk. And then fracture uh, repairs have an increased risk for problems during anesthesia, uh, probably associated with the stress of having the fracture in the first place. The estimated risk, as we said earlier, is somewhere between 1 in 63 to 1 in 1,000. I would tell you that the 1 in 1,000 is a report that Rudin Riddle published around 2006. Uh, it's it, we're the only practice that I know of. I wasn't here at the time, but the folks who were here at the time boldly, in my view, or uh, decided to look at this issue in their practice, and they found that their uh, incidence of significant complications was about 1 in 1,000. I don't know of any other private practice has gone ahead and looked at that and, and reported that. So we feel pretty good about our outcomes, although we'd like it to be zero, obviously. So our approach to anesthesia has been pretty consistent over time and has always been a priority. The anesthetic safety has always been a priority. Every person responsible for the anesthesia of the patient uh, gets fairly extensive training. Uh, by me and our other trained technicians who have been with us a number of years. Every time a horse is anesthetized, it either has a veterinarian or a trained technician assigned to anesthetizing the patient. We use pretty regimented protocols, so everybody knows what the horse has had. Everybody knows what to expect for a reaction. Everybody knows what to do if that uh, reaction doesn't occur. We're really good at minimizing anesthetic times. That's important for us. And we always assist anesthetic recoveries, which is a, is a big help in terms of uh, producing safe anesthesia. Courtney, uh, Whitney, you want to start that for me? Whoops. I can back it up. I backed it up. This is a video that's on our website that you may have seen, or if you want to see it, you can. Uh, this was made uh, several years ago. This is our surgical facility. Here comes uh, what appears to be a 
a thoroughbred in for surgery, one of the first things we do is wash their mouth out because uh, we don't want to, we place the endotracheal tube through the mouth and we don't want to push uh, feed material into the trachea, so we uh, try to get all the material out of the mouth. Every, cath every horse gets a catheter placed, we go ahead and sedate them, usually with xylazine, a drug that you're familiar with, and then we give our induction drugs and we push the horse against the wall and let it slide down the wall. That's a pretty typical induction. They go down into sternal recumbency. We roll them out. We'll go ahead and place an endotracheal tube and we put, uh, it's shown here, we do it again through the mouth. That's a, about a 30 millimeter endotracheal tube. You would have a, about a 10 millimeter tube placed if you, if you were anesthetized, we hook them, up, hook them up to shackles, hoist them, put them on the padded table that you see here. Uh, we place an arterial line. We monitor an electrocardiogram that's being placed here. Another thing we look at in the horse quite a bit is the eye for the depth of anesthesia. We always put eye lube in to protect the uh, cornea because they don't blink as well as they do when they're awake. Uh, we're prepping for the surgery here. We're then uh, clipping and prepping. We're rolling into the room. That's a 10-minute procedure. That doesn't happen in 30 seconds as it did there. Um, as I said, we have fast surgeons. You can see how fast that went. And here's the recovery. Uh, Steve Martin said comedy is not pretty. Well, recovery is very seldom pretty. That's a very nice recovery. It looks a little shaky to a number of you, I'm sure, but that's what you're looking for. You want the horse to get up, stand there squarely, and the reason you can see why we use the ropes, to hold them in position so they don't try to walk around and stumble. And with that, I think we better move along rather than have questions, so I'll say thank you.